Well, welcome to new Harry's Garage video. And this video is going to be a sort of summary of this crazy trip we did to the Lamborghini Countach. This is the ninth video in that series. It was 10 days away and it was 4,000 kilometers in all. So two and a half thousand miles. My goodness, last time, I was at Ferruccio Lamborghini's winery and we were just disappearing off to the restaurant, which we turned out to be really rather good. We had an excellent lunch there, good value. The only one thing was uh, it has a covered sort of car place to park your car and I managed to lift the door and sort of do the paintwork on the door, a little bit of damage as I went up. But yeah, what a place to do it, but there you go. So yeah, and then we came back just to that office and just some details I didn't know when I actually recorded that video. One, Fruscio Lamborghini actually bought that estate in 1968. So it had been ongoing when he actually moved there in 1974. He had owned it a while, um, but in 74, he really got stuck in and got the vines in, etc. And the other interesting fact was just outside the office, there was just a, a building there and, and a sort of, couldn't work out if it was sort of actually a warehouse or anything, but no, that was actually where Fruscio Lamborghini lived for all his time on the estate. He did restore some of the other buildings there, but just right outside the office was his house. And he had a sort of veranda that he could look over, look all the land up there. I parked the, the Kuntash there and just, it's, I've got that picture in my office now outside Ferruccio Lamborghini's house, which I'm very proud of. And there's a fantastic video of American CNN went out there and they did this investigation to what was Lamborghini, why he bought a Kuntash. And there's a lovely clip in that where Ferruccio drives into a tractor shed in one of his tractors and then comes out in the Kuntash. I'll just put a link to it up there. Um, other things that they told me also, which I found fascinating, was he, he really got stuck in. He liked driving tractors and working the ground and being basically a farmer. When his time on the estate, people almost didn't recognise it. He looked just a regular worker that was first down in the morning doing tractor maintenance out in the fields. He was hands-on farmer type on the estate. And they were quite upset actually about that recent Lamborghini film and how they portrayed him as in silks and wandering around the estate. They said there was absolutely nothing like that. But anyway, well worth a visit, a real piece of Lamborghini history. And we went off from there. We actually went to Siena. We didn't want to go too far that night because again, the forecast was horrendous for later that evening. And we stayed in a oh, place, hotel garden. You quite often ask which, where we stayed. I just, again, look for a place with good parking and close by Siena, because we wanted to go into Siena center. It's a, beautiful city one we know well and yeah we went in and the good thing about hotel garden it's pretty close it was only 12 euro taxi ride it's actually a bus stop straight outside uh, very convenient hotel loads of space it's all right really very good value as well about 120 or 130 euros had an amazing meal in Siena and it absolutely hammered down as forecast and the next morning got to this i thought god how's it going to like you must have had in like i don't know 70 80 mil of rain sat outside as usual just starts on the button doesn't seem to notice such events um, that you expect it to and the other thing to remember if you are driving in europe at the moment the mont blanc tunnel is closed it closed in september i can't remember the date but it reopens on late on the 16th of december so yeah good three months closure and so we actually headed to the freju tunnel which is well we got and we got there by going genoa and then up towards um, freju tunnel just a note, I was thinking as I was diving around that crazy autostrada that takes you into Genoa and then up, um, up into the, uh, towards the Alps and France. That is no place for a classic. Nowhere to stop on that motorway. It's mad. It's lots of sort of blind curves and you'll get, you're just with the traffic at 110, 120 kilometers. And it's crazy. It's Italian at its best or worst tunnels diving the tunnels but absolutely nowhere to pull off you do not want a car that's a bit wobbly and you might have to stop there is just nowhere to stop there so i was very glad i was in my dependable kuntas as we stormed through there and we went 
through the Frézou, more rain, etc., and stayed at Macon Sud, a little Ibis hotel there. Nothing to note, just en route. But I will give it a little recommendation. Great car park again, and an excellent meal we had there. And the owner of it, yeah, I think it was Dutch, I think. Um, and he, he spoke perfect English, and he's very into wine. So you get good wine and good food at a little Ibis, Macon Sud. From there, it was home and more rain, yet more rain as we approached Calais. And I was getting a bit worried now because the one thing was the tyres are oh, getting a bit worn. Ah, but anyway, we got through, got home and horrendous rain here at home. It seemed to be a theme of our 10 days away and since we've been back, just awful weather. Another thing I noticed on the way home was <laughs> It's a, it's a long way, you've got a lot of time to think. I thought I'd just work out the MPG as I'm cruising along at about 120, 130 clicks on autostradas aut and auto routes. And I measured it uh, with refilled in Macon. And much to my surprise, over the previous 900 kilometres, we had averaged 20.5 MPG. I've, when Ian Tira did all the rebuild, he did say it was running very rich. They retuned the carburettors but I now have a near 20 my MPG Kuntash, and I didn't think such a thing existed. I've always based it on about 16, 17 MPG, but on a cruise, it's just on a whiff of throttle when you're on a cruise, and uh, you can now eke this thing out. 20 MPG makes quite a difference. So I haven't actually washed it since it came back from the trip, so it's sort of looking grubby, but because we had so much rain, it's not quite as grubby as it might have been. Yeah, one thing I will be buying is a new wiper blade. There you go. I don't I say, try and not drive this in the rain so that I have never really found out that the wiper was a bit worn. Interesting, I used to get a lot of brake dust, but the most recent brake pads that Interior put on, no brake dust whatsoever on it. Come round, what is the, uh, yeah, it's worn tyres, that's my main thing. I'm, I feel quite proud that I've actually worn a set of tyres out on a Kuntash, because, yeah, not many people do that. You tend to change them more because of date rather than wear. But if I just quickly lift this up. I basically did nothing to this engine over the whole 4,000 kilometres. Th something I've learnt is this car can sit in traffic forever. And quite a few commented that, you know, stuck in that Milan sort of rush hour traffic. There's no worries. The temperature, you see it goes up, fans kick in, come straight down again. Oil temperature hardly moves. And we've been in Rome in this car uh, during the Lamborghini 50th. And you saw Mura's diver road boiling over. This just sat there, all Kuntash got through. I just checked the oil, didn't put any oil in during the trip. Yeah, you can just see, there's the mark there. Don't know if this camera will focus on this slightly. It's about one eighth of an inch below max. And you see it's still fairly clean. Uh, again, it doesn't use oil, this engine, even on that. It's used a little bit, but no need to actually top up, which is a nice thing. And as, as you saw in the video, there's Horacio Pagani's signature because he was responsible for this lid that I used to think was carbon, but actually turns out to be a sort of Kevlar fiberglass mix. I ought to just show you this as well. We, all, we ordered some wine from uh, Fruscia Lamborghini, the, the winery, we bought this red wine. I did actually try a, a bottle last night and drank slightly too much. It's very good and we'll be ordering some more. One thing they did mention when I was out there, they have no UK distributor. So if you are a wine distributor and you want to get Lamborghini on board, go give them a ring because they're very keen to talk to you. What else on this car? Now, I suppose I'll discuss some of the highlights of the trip. And I suppose my main highlight was probably that autobahn, discovering how good this was at speed. And it's, I've had this car a long time, 14 years. And I did a story very early on since owning it, within six months of owning it, in association with Octane. Went out to the factory and the idea was to choose the best Kuntash of all the iterations of Kuntash with Valentino Balboni refereeing. And this car was representing Cotra Valve. And after the test, it was on a Saturday, I then drove it back to France, just outside Monaco, Capfrat. 
And I left the factory at about six o'clock that evening. And I can remember filling up just south of Milan. And then I was going to turn left Alexandria, Genoa, Monte Carlo, that way. And I thought, this is just empty. I'm going to see what this is like at speed. I thought, if I'm going to get stopped for speeding, I'm in a Countach, I'm in Italy. You only live once, what's it like? And I sat this thing at about 200 clicks, sometimes going a bit more, and it just sang. And I couldn't get over how stable it was at speed, and it was a massive highlight. I basically fell in love with this car for that sort of journey. Wind forward to when we did that uh, Lamborghini 50th, I went out with Jeff Rowe, and it didn't feel the same on the motor. I couldn't understand it. It was slightly wandering. It was uncomfortable at speed. And I've since discovered these been super sensitive to chassis setup. As I've mentioned before, it's all rose joint suspension, front and rear, highly adjustable. And the sander setup is quite a lot of toe in for stability, a little bit of camber. And when it's bang on, it, it's arrow straight. This obviously when it was up at the interior was being all fully redone, was put in and the alignment was done again. And when I got to that German Autobahn, that early feeling that I'd experienced in 2011 was back in abundance and it was arrow straight. It, it was incredibly confidence inspiring when you're doing big speeds in a classic car, when it just seems I'm made for this, this is what I do. And Mrs. M was beside me and her least favorite pastime is going down an autobahn at speed. Not a murmur, nothing. She just said, well, this field car just felt solid, just felt fine. And the other thing about it, it does not feel strained in any way. Even at 150 miles an hour, it doesn't feel strained. I've got this magazine out because I just thought I'd reference it. This was uh, Peter Dron. He went out to Italy in what date is this? September 1986, I got Valentino to sign it. That's what that is. Countach at 195 miles an hour. What, you might say? But they figured a Countach back in 1986, a QV at the factory, without a wing. Now, the wing, I know I, this one did have a wing. The wing makes a big difference at speed. It was purely an ornament, has been explained. You could look up the story. It does nothing for lift. The, if there's anything on the contest, there's a slight lift at the front. And I think this stability at speed and its, its incredible ability to storm down an autobahn or autostrada, whatever speed you fancy, is because if you look back, when the contest was developed, Bob Wallace, the supercar at the moment, was the Mura. The one failing on a Mura was its lack of stability of speed, how it lifted the nose, it was very reliant on having a, a full tank of fuel at the front. It just wandered, it wasn't seen. If you're a development team, the one thing you want to cure is the ailment of your previous car. So this car was designed to be absolutely stable at speed. They didn't do a racetrack at Lamborghini. If you look at the development, what those team were doing, they used to race up the new then autostrades between Milan, Rome, and obviously Bologna. That was a key part of the development of this car, as well as its performance up in the hills and acceleration and power. And I think that's why this car was so good at speed. The other thing is that gearing I mentioned. First gear takes you to 58 miles an hour. So if I look at the figures they actually achieved, not 60 is 4.2 seconds, but they did admit they used 8,000 RPM instead of seven and a half red line. So they used extra revs to get beyond 60. Nought to 100, 10 seconds. 10 seconds in 1986 with one of these. And that's with two gear changes because third only takes you to 80. If this was a paddle shift gearbox in modern era, this would be eight point something to 100 miles an hour. It did the standing quarter back in 1986, 12 and a half seconds, 113.6 miles an hour. Serious speed. And then the way it accelerates, I did on, checked on the speed on the way home, between 80 and 100 miles an hour, it's five seconds. I looked in here, they actually made it 80 to 100, 5.5 seconds. If I dropped to four, 3.8 seconds. And every increment, if you go 90 to 100, 100 to 120, it's 5.5, 5.6, 5.6 seconds. It's incredible, the performance of this car. I have no doubt from that experience of the German Autobahn, they, they did an average, I think, a uh, two-way average of 190.1 miles per hour. This thing will post 180 plus piece of cake from my, I've, I've 
driven a lot of cars in Germany on autobahns. No issues saying this is a very quick car at the top end, despite it's got pretty poor CD factor, but it's quite a small frontal area. Second thing I want to say, comfort. We find this car very comfortable. As you say, it's one of the most comfortable cars to do big miles in. Now, I know there's lots of people on forums that tell you the exact opposite of that. I've only owned this car for 14 years and done 35,000 kilometers in it. But in my experience, I find it really comfy. And I'm just gonna demonstrate how that works. We've, we've mentioned before, these seats are like a deck chair. So they, they do this. So you can, you sort of recline it and you go back to this sort of angle and you drive it at this angle. And I did mention the hyper adjustable steering column. Huge amount of adjustment on it. And I just find I can get my perfect driving position. Yes, the clutch is really heavy. Yes, the gear change is really heavy. But once you're in gear, it's such a flexible engine, you can just use four for from town speed right up to 150 miles an hour. So that's a big surprise. And we've, and we've mentioned also how you've got qu quite decent storage inside. The glove box is just huge. It's a little slot, but it's so deep, you can hide a lot of things in there. And we find with that boot, taking that bit out of there, it's amazing how many bags you can pack into there. Yep. Other highlights of the trip, we're well, just finding out more about Fruscio Lamborghini. And, first visit to that Fruscio Lamborghini Museum in Bologna. A real highlight of the trip really, just so unusual, so different to the Lamborghini factory one. And I th lots of people have sort of commented, I never even knew it existed. For whatever reason, and I've never understood it, the modern Lamborghini basically have nothing to do with the Lamborghini family and the heritage of Ferruccio Lamborghini and Tonini Lamborghini in that museum and also the winery. Don't understand why, but it's there. If you are an enthusiast, if you are in the area, it's, that's definitely worth a visit. And also, you know, the, the winery itself and seeing that. Things I learned about Ferruccio, I didn't realise he was older son um, from a farming family and they had vines as well. So he, at his heart, he, he wanted to go back to the soil, to what he enjoyed, tractors. You know, I have some empathy with that, having been, you know, I'm in farming and I also do cars as well. So I think that's part of my personal attraction to the Fruscio Lamborghini story. And I just like the wildness that, you know, it was an utter passion project to do the Lamborghini cars. It's such a shame he had to sell it, but basically the tractor business had a major wobble when they had an order of 5,000 tractors going out to South America and suddenly they cancelled the order and he had all these tracks to sell. We had to raise money very quickly and had to sell some shares in Lamborghini Automotive to raise some capital very quickly. That's, the, that's another story there. So that was a massive highlight as well. So next steps for the Countach, well, it's going back up to Ionte or it'll have a service. I think we've done seven and a half thousand kilometers since that engine rebuild, so it's time for that. It's also time for an MOT. Thousands of you have pointed out that it didn't have an MOT complete oversight from my side, but that will get fixed and it will have a new set of tires as well all round. So it's going to have a proper refresh over the winter. So there you go. Who would have thought that the Countach can eat miles and is our car turnkey just works every time I use it. The only issues I've really had with this car was that big gearbox thing that Ian did, but it didn't actually stop us using this car. In the, it just got noisier and noisier until they think, we need to fix this gearbox. So from, in my experience, it has been extremely dependable. You know it always just starts on the button, doesn't overheat, and just say, eats miles. Oh, one, one other thing, yeah, with that fuel capacity and that MPG, 500 kilometers between fills. There aren't many of these sort of generation of cars that can do that. So extraordinary trip, all sorts of things we've done, <laughs> lots of memories there. Seeing that Bugatti, joining Horatio in that Pagani Utopia, seeing the factory, being able to compare the low body contest and the high body contest, one like this. 
just full of experiences and revisiting the Val d'Orta as well and the winery. We massively enjoyed that trip. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Next video, we'll get back to doing regular road tests and that sort of thing. But I just thought it was worth celebrating 50 years of this amazing car, or Lamborghini Countach. So hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, keep watching, keep subscribing. More videos coming on very soon.